Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your uh, SETI uh, talk series. Uh, and today we're very lucky to be joined by Sarah Seeger, who's uh, come across for a Kepler conference and has been, uh, has been good enough to uh, come and visit us here at SETI and, uh, and give a talk. Uh, Sarah uh, got a BSc at uh, University of Toronto and then a PhD at, at Harvard, which was uh, on exoplanets... Uh, uh, with strong ir uh, solar irradiation or stellar irradiation. Uh, after her PhD, she uh, went to the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton and then uh, Carnegie Institute at Washington. And then in 2007, she joined uh, the staff at MIT and she is the Ellen Swallow Richards Professor of Planetary Science at uh, MIT. Uh, Sarah has uh, written many papers on exoplanets, uh, particularly the theory of revolving around giant exoplanets. Uh, she's also written on the recombination epoch and uh, how it could be detected in the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, she's uh, looked at uh, exoplanets, as I mentioned, with uh, transmission spectra of giant exoplanets. Uh, and uh, she's also written on uh, biosignatures on exoplanets. Uh, and that's what uh, she's going to talk to us about today, habitable the possibility of having all exoplanets. So if you'll join me in uh, welcoming Sarah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Well, first let me thank all of you from... Um, <laughs> first I'll damage your hearing, and then, then we'll start the talk. But really, thanks to all of you for coming out for my talk tonight. I know it's a really chilly night for around here. And when we, when we have a night that's relatively this cold, what we're used to back where I live, people usually don't leave their houses. So, great to see you. Now, how many of you have been watching the news, the local and national news about Kepler? You're a very self-selected audience, I can see. Well, I'm going to start out my talk by talking about Kepler and saying a few things about it. And I also see some of my colleagues here in the audience. So, just to bear with me, the rest of you, I've thrown in a couple of just a few technical slides for them. So, to start out, here's a picture of Kepler, an artist's conception. NASA's Kepler Space Telescope will determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets and Earth-like orbits about sun-like stars. And there's a few other people here. If you're on the Kepler team or associated with Kepler, can you raise your hand so everybody can see who you are? Yeah, so a few people from the Kepler team. So these are other people you can ask questions of after the talk. But if you look at all the words up here, they were chosen very carefully by the Kepler team. So if you see the word Earth-sized there and not the word Earth-like, that's meaningful. And we'll be coming back to that. So what Kepler does, for those of you who don't know, is it's looking for transiting planets, planets that go in front of their star as seen from Earth. And can you see the transiting planet? Yep. In the top image, we don't see any stars like that other than our sun. We can't spatially resolve them. Their stars are just point sources in the sky, mostly. And you can see the bottom is showing you what Kepler does see, which is looking at the brightness of a star as a function of time. And by the way, I want to encourage all of you to ask questions during the talk. But not too many questions. <laughs> So there you go, there's a picture of what really we see. And there's one person here in the room, John Jenkins, who is largely responsible for taking the raw photon counts that hit the detector and translating them into curves that look like that. And there's many, many people involved who end up making a light curve from that. But what's really exciting about Kepler is that Kepler doesn't just do this for one star. Kepler is looking at 150,000 sun-like stars at once. And here's just a fraction of the stars that Kepler has found transiting planets around, or transiting planet candidates. Now what you see here, it's actually an illustration, because remember I said we don't see stars other than our sun spatially resolved like that. They mostly appear as point sources, just dots of light. But this is supposed to show you the relative size of the planet by the dark disk, and the relative size of the star, and the different sizes of the star relative to each other. And also, you see what else it's showing you is the impact parameter, where on the star's disk the planet appears to be crossing. And there's an even more fun slide. <laughs> this is made by another Kepler team member, Dan Fabricke. Calls it the Kepler Orrery. And here he's showing you, again, of just a fraction of the Kepler multiple planet transiting systems. And you can see here, if you look on the top right, see the numbers clicking by? 
those are in days. So it's sped up and showing you the relative speeds of the planets and the relative orbits and the mass of the planet shown by the size of the, the circle. You can see Kepler's laws at play here where the inner planet goes faster. And it's supposed to show you the, it conveys the diversity of planetary systems that Kepler has been finding. <coughs> so we could watch this go on, it's almost hypnotic. <laughs> watch it go on and on and on, but then we wouldn't get to the rest of the talk, so. Kepler-22 system. This one is exciting. It made the news, and I know my Kepler colleagues fielded lots and lots of interviews the whole week, basically, about Kepler-22. And Kepler-22 is, Kepler-22b, is Kepler's first planet in the habitable zone of its star. And the habitable zone is the zone around the star that's heated to the temperatures where liquid water could be present at a planetary surface if the atmosphere is just right. So Kepler-22b it's not an Earth-like planet. It's probably not a habitable planet. But it's the first relatively small planet that Kepler has found in the habitable zone. It's a big milestone for Kepler and for all of us in the search for other worlds like Earth. So in the news, it got a bit mixed up as an Earth-like planet. And there's a big difference between earth size and Earth-like. Because if you remember back to what you know about our planets, Venus and Earth, they're both earth size. In fact, they're both Earth mass, approximately, to within any level we could detect for other planets. And so Earth size, Earth mass are, can be very different from Earth-like. But this picture is showing you the relative, is showing you the Kepler-22b system with the planet that we know and our own solar system inner planets. Any questions on Kepler-22b? How many transits did you observe on Kepler-22b? Kepler observed three transits on Kepler-22b. And you want to see at least two so you get a period, and the third one helps confirm. You also can add the transits together and improve your signal. So what's really interesting is that the period, orbital period is 260 days. And they, this was a really lucky one because it showed up really nearly right away. So that's uh, Kepler 22b. Let me just give you a few remarks about why we think it's not habitable, although we don't know for sure. And that is because of the size. The planet is about two and a half times Earth's size. And that means for most of the, like, the other planets that are two and a half times Earth's size, they're also about, I'll come to your question in a minute, they're also they're basically low density planets. To get a planet that big for planetary masses that we think are reasonable, the planet has to have a massive atmosphere, so massive it's really an envelope of gas. And that envelope of gas acts like a massive greenhouse and should make the planet too hot at the surface for life. There is a small way that this planet could be habitable if it turned out, we don't know the mass of the planet, but if the planet turned out to be a whopping 30 Earth masses, then in fact it could be a gigantic rock and that would be actually two and a half, it could fit the two and a half Earth radius size. So we don't know what the planet is made of, we don't know the mass. But if we compare it to the population of planets we do know, it's likely a kind of puffy planet with a big gas envelope. Question? I was just curious if, if you, I was just curious if you knew anything about its spin rate, or is that? We do not know anything about its okay. spin rate. And this is interesting, because we all want to know everything there is to know about Kepler-22b. But what we do get from Kepler is we get a size and we get an orbit and we know something about the star's mass. And so it's a weird thing in exoplanets because we're kind of on the verge of knowing something exciting, but we're held back because we just have a limited amount of information. And in fact, that's what I do for my job, which I'm not gonna be able to convey during the talk, is how we get from knowing even more, speculating about all the possibilities using computer models of applied physics. That's what I do for my job. So that I could launch into a long diatribe about it, but it would bore most people in the room. So now I'm gonna get to, oh, now I'm gonna to get to the main part of my talk, and here's a, a, ga a real photograph of a galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of bound stars. Okay, hold on a second. My screen just did something weird here. Okay, and the dot here, the pointer goes there, represent, we think our galaxy looks like, the, our, that our galaxy, the Milky Way, looks like this photograph of this particular galaxy. And I wanna ask you, our sun is supposed to be about here. And the Kepler field, I have to ask someone from the Kepler team, but I think it's, which, where is it relative to this dot? It's along one of the arms. It's along one of the arms, and it's about um, a kiloparsec away. So maybe like here. So the Kepler field's about there. So I wanted just to give you a sense of where the Kepler field is and how far from our own sun we can find planets. So that Kepler field of all those 150,000 stars and the 2,000 planet candidates, it's really not that far away. So despite the fact that we have hundreds of billions of stars in our own galaxy and upwards of hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe, 
Right now, we're really only searching for other planets, signs of planets very, very close to Earth. So what my talk is going to be about today, and this is what the book is about. It's actually an e-book, and I also have printed it as a little book. It's the questions that I get asked the most often. And these are questions that I get asked, uh, asked by people like you, by people like my colleagues, by people I meet on the airplane, by journalists, by other scientists. All walks of life, they all ask the same questions over and over and over again. And these are the questions. So I'll be answering these one at a time at a very kind of basic level. So the first question is, what could aliens see looking at Earth from afar? And we ask this question because eventually we want to be able to look for a planet like Earth. So what can aliens see looking at Earth from afar? We actually know what Earth looks like from far away. We have a real movie of Earth taken by a spacecraft that you might have heard of deep impact spacecraft that in 2005 dropped a bomb to a comet and we watched what happened afterwards. Well, after that was done, the, teles the spacecraft was just coasting through space and a team of people got together and used it for other things. It went on to look at another comet and as it was traveling to the other comet, one of the things that epoxy, it was called, did was look back at Earth. So we have a real movie of Earth by the epoxy mission. And this is a movie taken at 31 million miles from Earth. It's a three color composite. And if you look closely here, you could see the specular reflection of the sun off the ocean, a bright spot. Look how red the continents are in this color combination. And we were really lucky. This was not planned. The moon transited the Earth. So that's what Earth looks like from far away. And what the epoxy team did was they took Earth and they tried to see if they, this is like the Carl Sagan experiment that he wrote about in 1993. If you didn't know anything about Earth, what could you learn about it? And uh, found, well, let's watch it one more time. Found what it, what it looked like. So a bunch of things went on here to try to understand what Earth looks like. It turns out if you want to try to model Earth, not like this, but all integrated into a point source, it ends up being complicated and clouds are what really messes things up for you. And I'm going to throw in a couple of technical comments here and there, but the student working on this, he had to have like 13 different cloud parameters. And it basically made it almost impossible to do anything. But the really interesting thing was it had reflected and thermally emitted light, the wavelength that it was observed in spectra. And this played a kind of interesting thing to try to understand Earth. So the question is, what would it take to look at Earth like that? If the aliens are out there, if they have resources and the interest in putting space telescopes up to look at Earth and find a movie like this, they would actually need something like 50, that's 5-0, 50 meter diameter telescopes in space, all working together as an interferometer. So if they're out there at about 10, 20, 30 light years away, if they want to get a movie of us like this, it's going to be a pretty expensive thing to do. So what they're more likely to be looking at, and this is what we hope to do, and there's people in this audience who actually work on this, we call it looking for the pale blue dot. And this is also a real picture of Earth. I bet you many of you know where this picture comes from. It, Carl Sagan's idea to look at, use the Voyager 1 spacecraft from 4 billion miles away to look at Earth, pale blue dot. What I like about this image is, see how there's, can you see the pale blue dot in, dot in there? And see the red band? That red band is actually from scattered light in the camera optics. But I like it because if we find an exoplanet, we might expect to see a red band, not from hopefully not from instrument systematics, but it would be from the zodiacal dust in our own atmosphere, in our own, I don't work on atmospheres when I say that, but in our own solar system, we have the asteroid belt and the asteroids collide and they make dust and that dust reflects and looks red. So we might have a zodiacal dust belt like this. So this is what it is. But the aliens may not need to see Earth spatially resolved like in that movie. If you see this pale blue dot, you can actually learn a lot about Earth. And you can actually, this pale blue dot would vary in brightness with time on the order of 20% as continents and clouds rotate in and out of view. So you could see the pale blue dot varying with time. And what, the, what we really want to do and what we would hope the aliens are doing if they're looking at us is measuring spectra to see what gases are in our planetary atmosphere. And the spectrum here, in case anyone doesn't know what a spectrum is, I'm going to explain it, taking the white light of the sun and breaking it up in a prism, just like if you see a rainbow outside, did you know that if you could look really closely at that rainbow, you would see some dark lines? And those dark lines, they're not exactly between colors. They're in different places and they're of different strengths. But those black lines are parts of light missing from absorption from our own Earth's atmosphere. And those lines they are shown here, just, this is just a cartoon. These lines aren't really anything specific. But those are just showing you what happens with the spectrum. And so essentially, that's what we do when we look at spectra. And here's a real spectrum of Earth. And in this spectrum, you see that the lines, if you measure those lines, like how dark they really are, they're not completely dark. There's sort of an intensity variation with them. 
the top plot is showing you the normalized reflectance. And by the way, I don't have too many graphs for the non-graphically oriented people here. There's a, it's showing you the, ref, the light, er, um, Earth's reflected light that's normalized. This is visible wavelengths. This is near infrared. But what you really have to do is just simply agree with, agree with me that this spectrum is different from a straight line. So if you don't, I don't have time to explain what this really is. It's different from a straight line. If there was no absorption, it would be a straight line. Yes? Where were these observed from? Where were these observed from? Great question. And these are actually Earth spatially integrated. So you know, if you're looking at Earth from a space satellite, chances are you're only looking at a small region of Earth. This one is taken by a spacecraft en route to Mars that looked back at Earth. And we actually try to, there's a small community of people who tries to get spacecraft to look back at Earth. But if you're looking back at Earth, you're often looking at the sun. And that's a problem. Yeah. This one looked back from Mars. And this actually one is taken by Earthshine. You know when you see the crescent moon and you see part of the moon lit up? That's sunlight that hits Earth, that hits the moon, then comes back to Earth. And it turns out the, mer the moon is such a, you know how it's so rough on the surface? It's such a poor mirror that it scatters, jumbles all the rays together and ends up making it look like Earth, Earth's light is all integrated together, all blurred together like it's just a point source. So that top one is from Earthshine. And Earthshine actually, just throwing a little side here, that there's someone who studied Earthshine actually for Earth's global warming. And they wanted to know whether the cloud fraction was increasing or not. And they looked over about 10 years. And the person who became an expert at this, he claimed if he was looking at the moon, the Earth shine with his naked eye, he could see Asia rising. That means he could see that dark part of the moon that slightly lit up brighten as Asia kind of came into view. And if you watch it carefully, I don't think it works here because I'm guessing that when you see that Earth shine, it's coming from the Pacific Ocean. But where I live in Boston, if you look at Earth shine, you see the moon, the Earth shine is so super bright, it usually means that west of you in the US is covered with snow. So actually, it's kind of interesting. You can see, you can actually, if you wa start watching it now, I don't think we'll see it tonight, because if you've seen the moon tonight, it's pretty close, uh, getting closer to fall. So what we see here is we see some gases. You see what the biggest gas is? Biggest feature, water vapor is actually Earth's most strong greenhouse gas. We don't hear about it in the news, because we're not contributing to water vapor in our atmosphere. We have water vapor. We want to find water vapor on a small planet, because it is indicative of liquid water oceans. All life, requires, all life on Earth requires liquid water. So we'd like to find a planet with liquid water. The problem is we can't really see liquid water remotely. We can see water vapor much more easily, and that's why we want to see liquid water. Also notable on this planet, on this, on this planet on Earth, is oxygen. Oxygen fills our atmosphere by, to 20% by volume, yet it really shouldn't be in our atmosphere at all. It's created by plants and photosynthetic life, and if we didn't have plants and photosynthetic life, our oxygen would be something like 10 orders of magnitude less. So oxygen is what we call a biosignature gas. And here's ozone, a byproduct of oxygen. Here's carbon dioxide. But just one more thing. Um, I actually teach a class on global warming, because if you understand Earth's atmosphere, it's related. And you see here how strong this carbon dioxide signature is. And remember I said oxygen is 20% by volume? Does anyone remember the number for carbon dioxide? 380 parts per million. And look at the huge signature it creates. Carbon dioxide, yeah, that's why it's a greenhouse gas. It's so spectroscopically active. So those things that are bad for greenhouse global warming and greenhouse gases, they're good for exoplanets, because we can see them from far away. So this is the summary of this part. What could aliens see looking from, at Earth from afar? A pale blue dot that, with brightness that varies with time. An atmosphere that has water vapor, oxygen, ozone, and carbon dioxide. That's basically what they would see. OK. When will we find another Earth? This is the question everybody wants to know. And it turns out it depends on how you want to define Earth. If you want to define Earth as Earth size, that will be very soon. If you want to define it as Earth-like, where we have liquid water oceans and oxygen and carbon dioxide, that will be in the future. If you'd want to define, we had a talk by Jill about when is an Earth analog a true Earth analog. You want to find the radio signal. So actually, there's, it really depends how you want to define it. But let's define Earth like a reflective body like our own planet is. And this is a very, very challenging thing to detect. The analogy people like to use is looking for an Earth. Well, first of all, let me say that trying to find an Earth, Earth itself is not so faint. It's not fainter than the faintest galaxies ever observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. The problem is that Earth is right next to a very, very bright star, our sun. And these other Earths, they're also not that faint, considering what we're capable of observing. But the stars there beside are 10 billion times brighter than the planet. And people like to equate this to a firefly next to a searchlight, when that firefly and searchlight are both 2,400 um, 2, miles away. Now, what I was going to tell you about this figure was, this picture, 
was this was in a National Geographic article from some number of years ago. And I was consulting for the magazine for this article, where my job was to help them with their pictures and illustrations and make sure they were right. What they wanted to do was take a picture of the firefly next to the searchlight analogy. And I bet you can guess that that firefly is not 10 billion times fainter than that searchlight. <laughs> well, they actually rented the searchlights. They rented these searchlights and put them in a field and tried to take the picture. And the first thing I complained about was I really didn't like the searchlight idea. I bet you in the Kepler field you don't have any stars that are like all packed together like that. So they have these searchlights all packed together. They wanted to take the firefly. They ended up having to fudge it because if they can't take the picture, they don't have the dynamic range on their detector. We can't do this for exoplanets yet. It's a problem for everybody. But what I loved about the National Geographic photographer and writers, they're among the smartest people I've met. They ask the hardest questions. But they came back super excited. And they told me, you know what, we can't do the direct imaging thing where you try to take the picture of the firefly beside the searchlight, but we can take the picture of the firefly in front of the searchlight. And on their own, in the layperson's way, they had found that a transit is much easier to detect than direct imaging. Where direct imaging, the star is 10 billion times brighter than the planet, if it's Earth and Sun analog. But transit, when the planet goes in front of the star as seen from Earth, now it's a matter of the planet area compared to the star area. And that effect is a part in 10,000 about. So one part in 10,000 is very hard to do, extremely hard. But one part in 10 billion is even harder. So they figured that out, and that was great. But I had to tell them that's not what your article is about. <laughs> your article is not about Kepler or about transits. It's about direct imaging. And just to explain, I know everybody didn't understand that analogy of depth. But here's the movie again. See that planet that's about the size of Earth? That's about the si relative to the size of that sun. And that planet going in front of that star. Remember, we don't see that spatially resolved star. We just see brightness of the star is a function of time. And that drops in brightness according to the planet to star area ratio. And that tiny drop in brightness is about a part in 10,000. So that actually is very hard to do, but it's easier than direct imaging. Here's this Kepler spacecraft launching in March 2009. And again, here's the Kepler spacecraft. Kepler is going to determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone of sun-like stars. And I thought I'd throw in one of my favorite diagrams from this conference. This is the size distribution of planets, February versus December. This should say December here. So blue is February, this is December. And this is size relative to Earth. And here you just have a normalized fraction. So what can you see here that really jumps out at you? This is one of my favorite results from Kepler, and indeed one of my favorite results in exoplanets of all time, that small planets are much more common than large planets, at least for the orbital periods that Kepler has sampled so far. And we actually know this is true even for planets further out by another technique called microlensing. So what we see here is really interesting. It means that planets right now of about two or three Earth radii are way more common than planets that are Jupiter sized, which is about 11 Earth radii. And planetary formation theorists do not know how these planets form. Today we had about five separate talks where everybody put up their own computer simulation and they, couldn't, they didn't really form these things before, but guess what? Now they can form them. <laughs> they have a lot of different ways to form them. Um, okay. It's sort of a joke from the meeting because there's always a conflict between observation and theory. Theory is supposed to predict stuff, and that's one way to know if a theory is right or not. But theory can always explain things. And so that was a kind of interesting. So you see here lots of planets. And you can also see that between February and December that the number of smaller planets increased. Because as time goes by, more signals built up. It's easier to see smaller objects. So now I'll just say a few words about direct imaging. This is one of the direct imaging planetary systems. This is an A. I have some notes about what this is here. It's an, a big star, about 40 parsecs. That's about 120 light years from Earth. These planets are orbiting the star. And this star doesn't really look like a star, right? What happened was the people who did this image, they subtract out the star so you can see the planets. So it's like as if you took a picture with snow. I know you don't have snow here, but it's the best analogy. Snow and people, and you removed all the snow from the picture, you still have some granulation left over where the snow is because you can't remove it perfectly. Essentially, that's what happened here. So here they have these planets, BCD, and it looks great, right? And they even saw a little bit of orbital motion. But the issue here is that look how far these planets are from the star. It's nowhere near an Earth-Sun distance. 24, 38, and 60 astronomical units, where Earth's semi-major axis is one astronomical unit. And the difference in brightness between these planets and star is about 100,000. So this is really great. We love this image, but it's not really going to cut it for what we need to do for Earth. Mm -hmm. Is this star really as big as it appears, or is that just? No, it is not as big as it appears. It's a point source. If you went outside and looked at it, if you took a picture, it gets spread out on the, 
over a few pixels just by the camera optics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, subtract it out. Is that spectroscopically? No, this is. Um, does anyone else here know? I can't remember exactly what, how they did this. This is. Pardon me? Yeah, they did something called angle differential imaging. They turn the picture and they subtract it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have storms and stuff that are you know larger than Earth size objects on the surface of stars. Don't those mess up your reading? Or Great question. The question is about storms, sunspots, or yeah, or all kinds of storms. Yeah, a lot of the storms on the sun, like if you think of a flare, they happen at a they have a very specific shape that's not related to a transit, and many of them are only visible in certain wavelengths. But sunspots actually are turning out to be quite useful. They don't often, I mean, the sunspots themselves create a problem because they make the, the star does not appear constant time, it varies. But the sunspot will never look like that transit shape. And the transit has a certain period that often never coincides with the rotational period of the star. But the star spots, I think, they've been bad in a way because they've made the stars more noisy, but they've also been good because people can actually see the transit happens and those star spots eventually migrate, and people can actually learn something about the geometry of the star. So actually, we end up liking the star. Well, some of us like the star spots, some of us don't like them. But let's move on with direct imaging. We have this phrase in exoplanets. Some of us still champion this phrase. All roads lead to terrestrial planet finder. And terrestrial planet finder is what we want to happen later on after Kepler. If Kepler tells us that Earths are very, very common around almost every star, we'll have confidence that if we go out and we're able to look at the 100 nearest stars, we will be able to to do direct imaging in the future. I just want to throw out a few slides about this. And the problem that we have with finding the Earth, remember the Earth and the star, is even if we had a perfect telescope, we have to deal with diffracted light. And here's showing you a direct imaging telescope. You can think of this as your mirror. And if you look at a star, even if it's a point source, you won't see a point source. You will end up seeing this image. This is a logarithmic scale of this. You will end up seeing this because of diffracted light, light diffracting around the edges of the mirror. And you can think of it like dropping a pebble in a pond. You start to see ripples. These are just like ripples, essentially. And the problem with these ripples is that first one, we call it the first airy ring, it is actually several orders of magnitude. It's about 100,000 times brighter than that planet you're looking for. So that's a real problem. Direct imaging is a problem. People have come up with many clever solutions. Here are some. One is to, you can think of this as making your mirror a very special shape. So the light diffracts in a very specific way. Imagine if your mirror was this shape. And in fact, you don't really make your whole telescope mirror this shape. It's just a shape somewhere along the optical path. But just to simplify, if it's this shape, you get this pattern. So if you had a point source and this was your mirror shape, you would see this. Some locations of the image would be very bright. Others would be dark. It ended up the problem with this was the darkest part. Dark enough was really only a thin line along this axis. And look, if your mirror is this shape, you'd have this. And one of my friends and colleagues did a, compl a complete mathematical solution. And he found, what about this shape? You get this. Nice, huh? And there's many ways to solve this problem. The one that uh, is, I will say, the most picturesque, for lack of a better term, is instead of having that shape on your inside of your telescope, having it on the outside. And the idea is that if you could put a telescope here, oh, I forgot to say one thing. The problem with this idea is that your telescope mirror has to be almost perfectly smooth, way, way smoother than a human hair, because any distortions in the telescope will mess up this pattern. So one other concept, we call, it, we call these, all these things terrestrial planet finder. It gets called TPFC-C if it's a chronograph, a shape on the inside. It gets called TPFO if it's on the outside. We call it TPFI if it's an interferometer. But here's the shape on the outside. And the question is, what if you could block out the starlight, just like you can put your hand up and block that light? Well, you can't block it with a circular or a square screen in space because you'd have diffracted light. You have to have a special shape. And it's, the same special, it's a similar or same special shape you'd have to make them the ones I showed. So look at this. If you could fly a screen at some distance from a telescope that doesn't, no longer needs a perfect mirror, you actually would be able to find a planet. And this here is this, the challenge for this particular. I see that no one looks too surprised or unsurprised. Usually people have a reaction one way or the other. They either love this idea or they hate it. It's a very, very hard idea. What would happen is you actually would have to, this would have to be about 50 meters in diameter and about 50,000 kilometers away from the space telescope. But see, you get that now. But you know, the other idea I told you is equally hard. Because you have to have that perfectly smooth mirror that, by the way, you have to correct for in real time. Mm -hmm. When you say finding the planet, you mean seeing it not as a transit, but as yes, a Yes, I mean seeing planet. it as direct imaging. Blocking out the starlight so you can see the planet alone. But I like this better because you don't get any light at all from the star in the telescope. Mm -hmm. 
exactly. Really a bigger win than actually having the mirror be in that shape. It is. So that's why it sounds more attractive. And then the telescope itself doesn't have to be too super special. Right. How are you aim it? The problem is, how are you going to fly this thing? Yeah. And station <laughs> keep. You have to station keep it. No, you could do it. People think if you can put like a laser beacon on the telescope, there won't really be a problem. But keeping this thing, they have very special tolerances. The shape of those pedals, they can only bend so far out of the plane and keeping that thing together. But we really do, a lot of people do really like this idea. Well, you, mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about, and usually you're putting these things, well, I guess you have this in orbit around Earth, but I mean, some people talk about putting these things in the outer solar system. They do, they used to. That actually was even more difficult. But you could put this out at, yeah, you probably wouldn't like low Earth orbit, the same reason Kepler's not in low Earth orbit, yeah. because the, at, the Earth does not make a friendly environment. But just so, some of you will think, oh, this is pie in the sky. I mean, it is pie in the sky right now. It's a very expensive way to do things. But I wanted to show you another kind of cool picture. These are two of my best students from MIT who we, they actually went out to JPL to do a presentation on some engineering work. Do you know what that, who wants to guess what that thing is in the back? Remember what I was talking about, that the screen, it's related to the screen. Is that the, uh, the, uh, the shield? It's one, one petal of the shield, one petal. So there's been technology demonstration work going on. When I see this, I like to, I think of the Star Trek movies. You know that recent Star Trek, it wasn't that recent, but in Star Trek they showed the very first people who went to space. They were kind of on the primitive side. I feel like when people look back at us, they'll see this picture, like, wow, those guys were so primitive. They made one <laughs> pedal, <laughs> pedals two-thirds scale. And JPL, this is at JPL, they were trying to show that they could unfurl the pedal. And they had it wound around this wooden structure, and they unfurled it. And actually, whoever took this picture, the, this actually goes out really, really far. It has to go out the pedal. It ends up ending into this long point here. But anyway, they do show how it unwinds. It was part of the, you know, the demonstration to see, can you really build something like this? If you built it, would it only be able to look at one star? Good question. No, it would have to look at more stars. And it would actually have to have fuel to be able to fly around. Uh, so one idea is maybe you send up two. So while one's moving around, you can use the other one, because it would take at least two weeks to get enough <laughs> signal to see a planet. Another idea was, well, let's use the James Webb Space Telescope. Then the astrophysics community can use it while the screen is flying around to a new spot. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. And we'll see where this is going to go. Yes, question? The size of the pedal depends on the size of the telescope? Or? It scales with the telescope, yes. And it has to do with the distance between the telescope and, and the shield. So to answer this part of the talk, when will we find another Earth in an Earth-like orbit? Earth's size planet frequency, less than three years. Maybe that's about three years with Kepler. We may find an Earth mass planet. I didn't talk about another planet. I didn't talk about the other many other exoplanet discovery techniques out there, but there are other ways to find them. We may be able to find them with the so-called Doppler or Wobble method. But if we want this direct imaging and we want to build a complicated screen, you know, if enough money was given to the project today, it would take 10 to 15 years to get the thing off the ground and launch. So I put a 15 to 25 year range here. Now, Terrestrial Planet Finder used to be an ongoing thing. It was funded at $50 million a year by NASA. And now it's not funded. Maybe a few million a year goes towards technology development. And there's someone in this room who actually works on direct imaging and has a lab at NASA Ames to work on the related. But, you know, I didn't come here to tell you bad news about stuff that's pie in the sky that will take forever. So there is a, another part to this question. When will we find another Earth part two? And in this case, if you're willing to change your definition of Earth, make it a little easier to find, then actually the story is quite different. In this particular case, if we forget about the true Earth analog, the Earth twin, the planet that is Earth-like around an Earth-like sun, around a sun-like star, it this becomes very different. So we've talked about the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone, the distance from the star where with a thin atmosphere the planet will have surface liquid water. Planets are heated by their stars, largely, and so the distance from the star is really critical. Here's a schematic showing Earth at some distance from the star. And now I'm showing you a much smaller star down here called an M star. These stars are very much more common than sun-like stars. The star is so small, its luminosity output is lower, and the habitable zone is much closer to the star. So actually, that actually makes it a little easier to detect the, the planet. So if we decide to look for a big Earth orbiting a small star, transiting that small star, many things become favorable for the detection. It's bigger compared to the star. The ratio is bigger, so the transit signal is bigger than it would be for an Earth around a sun. The period, someone asked about Kepler-22b and how many times it has been observed. It was observed for three transits, but that was over uh, many, many days, hundreds of days. In this particular planet, 
it would orbit in about 13 days for the example I'm showing. So you'd only wait 13 days for, to see more and more transits. The probability to transit is also higher. Mm -hmm. Does that ever get to the ratio where you can actually see absorption lines? Great question. Does it ever get to the ratio where you see absorption lines? We believe that with the James Webb Space Telescope, some of these will be at the right ratio to see absorption lines. So that's why we're excited about this particular type of planet. That hasn't been yet. Pardon? There have? You're saying there have or there haven't? There, haven't. there have been a few, actually. And there have been called Gliese 581 system has been the one people have been talking about. First it was Gliese 581C looked habitable, then we ruled that out, then D was habitable, and then there was one EF or G. So there have been ones that have been close to being in the so-called habitable zone. There's none that, there may be one that people think is in the habitable zone, but there have not been any rocky planets found transiting small stars. But there may be one happening sometime. I don't know of any secrets, but it's something that's likely to happen sometime. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't some of this, uh, using a planet that's in orbit around a very small red star, uh, wouldn't it uh, be close enough that it might gravitationally be locked so it's always facing one side towards the star? Yes. And then the other problem, I guess, with those is these small red stars tend to have a lot of ultraviolet. They do. Well, let me get to the next part. That was my next slide. So let me talk about that. And I'll talk about some of the pros and cons of this planet. So one thing that I and others do is model exoplanet atmospheres, and we try to understand what the planets would be like around these small stars, and what the atmospheres and conditions would be like. But instead of going into a lot of detail about my models, let me take you on a virtual trip to one of these planets. And here's an artist's conception. This originally was made for Gliese 581c. And if you pay attention to the news, there is sometimes a joke saying a habitable planet has been found again and again and again. <laughs> but people's memories are short, so you might not remember this one. <laughs> but here we are. If you went to one of these planets, the first thing is the sun would be very big in the sky. Let's see on this artist's conception. There's the sun, very, very big, because you're so close to the star. The other point that was raised by this question here is that the planet is so close to the star, it's tidally locked. That means it shows the same face to the star at all times, just like the moon does to Earth. And what this would mean if we could physically go to that planet is the star, the sun, would be the same place in the sky at all times. So you could choose where to live. Would you live where it's always day? Or if you're a real astronomer, you'd live where it's always night. <laughs> or you could vacation live where the sun is always setting. And what you see here is another planet in the same system transiting. They're showing another planet here in artist conception, just taking the artist's license to make the sky look a different color. Another thing I like about this planet is the year would only be about 13 days. And what this means is, unlike in the Kepler field, where now the field has set, you've got to wait a number of months before you can observe the objects again you'd actually have time to observe them more frequently as that part of the sky came into view more often. And there aren't any really little children here, but what I always like to tell it if there's children here is that, in fact, because the year is so short, you would have your birthday every 13 days, <laughs> which is bad news for the people, who, those of us who don't really want to get any older. <laughs> okay, so the, the flip side also relates to the question that just was over there, is that maybe this planet is not so favorable. M stars tend to flare. Think of how people are worried about the sun going towards solar maximum with flares maybe disrupting our satellites or wireless. And this UV radiation that also comes from some of these stars would be, could be bad for life itself. Maybe life has to live on the dark side or subsurface. We don't really know. Other planetary theorists complain that volatiles, that is water-rich rocks and planetesimals, would not be able to be delivered so far in where these planets live. And so there's a lot of pros and cons. But let's just say we don't have a lot of options right now. So we will look for whatever's out there. And to summarize this part of the talk, when will we find another Earth part two? A big Earth transiting a small star? I'll say within one to three years. We will see what happens. People are waiting for this. We're hoping it's out there. We're hoping that ground-based observers can get their you know, noise down enough to find one of these things, and that a pool of them are found in time for the James Webb Space Telescope, which now it looks like they have plenty of time. <laughs> to um, The James Webb has been delayed. In fact, there was just a big hearing about it today. We didn't... It's... Uh, webcast now for anyone here who's interested in the James Webb. There was a big congressional discussion about it, and some of our colleagues actually presented there. But we've been busy with the Kepler meeting, so no one's been really paying attention to that. So when we find Earth part two, a big Earth transiting a small star within one to three years. So after all this, when we find the Earth, the next question I get, and this question I get asked the most often of all of them, is can we go there? <laughs> and I think you're maybe a slightly more sophisticated audience, but you would be surprised, because I think the question stems from the fact that we're all explorers at heart. We really want to go places. We want to see things. Our own Earth has pretty much all been explored. People have been almost everywhere. And now what is left? We feel like we want to go somewhere else. And that's why I get this question over and over again. 
So let's talk about distances. This projected, this is a real picture of our sun. And I want to just briefly talk about distances of planets and stars. How big do you think the Earth is compared to this picture? <coughs> the dot, yeah, you guys are good. The dot. Diameter. It's the, that size. And I had to look pretty hard to find a nice picture of the sun that only had one dot. So that's the size. But then the question is, where would Earth be if this was the size of the sun? Does anyone want to take a guess? How far from the sun would Earth be to scale with this picture? San Francisco. OK. Any other guesses? Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Okay. I'm not really familiar with the geography around here, so those don't mean enough. Does anyone want to guess something else? I know some people here know the answer. 150 times the diameter. OK. Someone said 150 times the diameter. OK. I think that's probably closer. Do you think if Earth is 6,400 kilometers in radius about, and the sun is about six or seven times 10 to the eight kilometers in radius. So yeah, it's about, a, let's call it 100. So if you think of 100 suns, 100 diameters, that's where it would be. So somewhere out there, not that far. But now what about if this was the size of the sun, where would the next, next star be? <laughs> you know, I, I think we had that thing, there were some people under 18 here who I think are, must be in school. This would be a really good homework problem. New York. New York somewhere? It would be in New York somewhere somewhere across the country. Very far, think about that. I mean, it's a fun question, but think of how far the stars are separated. Yep. And that is a real problem for when we want to go to the other stars, is how are we going to get there? Well, Alpha Centauri is a 4.2 light years away. It's our nearest sun-like star. Voyager 1 would take over 70,000 years to reach the nearest star. Voyager 1 is going at about 20 kilometers a second. And what I discovered when I was just browsing to update a few things from my talk, was you can go to a website, a NASA website, and you can see where Voyager 1, how far from Earth it is. And it, it updates like in real time. It's very far. It's like 10 billion miles away. So this is a problem. If it was pointed towards the nearest star, 70,000 years. But if you guys read the popular science or things like that, what was really interesting to me was a couple months ago, there was a conference sponsored by DARPA, DARPA Starship Conference. And actually, people got together. And to me, it was really exciting. I didn't go to the conference. but the fact that it's publicly acknowledged that it's not just a joke, and that for the first time, people have been thinking about this for a while. Maybe there is some way to possibly go. And there are a group of people who think at some point we could travel at a tenth the speed of light. And I'll tell you something. Whenever I give this talk to a college age group, I always tell them, you know, if you could travel at a tenth the speed of light, and the closest star is about four light years away, how many years is that? 40, 40 years. Well, we didn't take account about speeding up and slowing down, but let's put those aside for now. I said, you know, the good age, if we were going to send a person on such a trip, would be about 20 years old. So you go in the spacecraft, get there when you're 60, and then you can explore the planet, and you'll still live for some time. And every single time I give this, I ask people this, someone will always come up to me afterwards on their own initiative and say, no, I would go. If there was a way to do this, I would give my life, and I would go to be the first person to travel to another planet. Time dilation would be tiny. Time dilation doesn't come into effect until you're essentially close to the speed of light. So it's sort of interesting. I really like it just because it is the most popular question I get asked. And even when I explain it to the audience, I'll still get asked in the question period again and again and again. So there's a reason why people want to go. But can we go there? Not for now. And the follow-on question, if we can't go there, why look? <laughs> so we could ask them, um, why look? So you're a bit of a self-selected audience. But we do it because we do remote sensing for exoplanet studies. We try to study planet interiors. Based on a mass and radius measurement, we can tell the average density of a planet. And we use models to infer what the mean composition could be, the variety of compositions. We study exoplanet atmospheres. Over three dozen exoplanet atmospheres have been observed. These aren't Earth's, but these are big, hot Jupiter planets and some Neptune, Neptune-sized hot planets. We have observed them with Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer Space Telescope, and also ground-based telescopes. Eventually, we hope to look for biosignature gases. I want to add here, because this is the SETI Institute, that when we find gases that we may attribute to life, we will not know if they come from intelligent life or if they're gases produced by bacteria. OK. So what I really like about I love astrobiology. And what I love about life on Earth is, well, I really like all the cool places astrobiologists get to go. I was lucky enough to go to Yellowstone. Here's a picture of Yellowstone. But Life in Extremes, this was put out by NASA Astrobiology. They have this nice. Uh, file, and then on the back, it tells you something about each place. But what it's trying to convey is that life exists in some of the most extreme environments on Earth. Pretty much anywhere you look, as long as there is water, there is life. 
and there's a few they show thermophiles that live in hot water in Yellowstone, you can see boiling water. They tell you to be really careful not to fall in. People have fallen in before, and they don't survive. But boiling water, but you know, if you put a glass slide there and come back, you'll find life on the slide. Life can survive in boiling water. And life can survive in all these other crazy places also. Very acid in a rock, very non-acidic, non very salty. And that does give us hope for exoplanets, that although these extremes are not what we see in other worlds, we think the extremes are much more. But the fact that life on Earth is resilient and lives in every place gives us hope for exoplanets. Now we have a couple of other reasons why we do exoplanets, and I'm going to mention a few of them. And one is STEM and public interest. Here's a picture of my students out at JPL. Here's an article from the New York Times, which came out Saturday as before the conference. If you haven't read it, I, I urge you to go and read this article of the New York Times, Hot on the Trail of Just Right Far Off Planet. And it's great because it summarizes exoplanets and astrobiology. So if you don't have time to read a long book, you just read this article. It summarizes it. And they also, in the article, as like a sidebar, they give you a list of other different astrobiology books that are worth reading. The Kepler, I was told by the Kepler outreach team that over a thousand articles have been written about Kepler, about Kepler 22b and Kepler news. So there's a huge thirst. Hmm? This week. This week, yeah, this week. And do you want to, I don't know if you want to add or subtract to that statement? No. no. Yeah, this week alone. And the place was so packed, I understand that my colleagues who were on, you know, responsible for Kepler 22b, they're constantly interviewing for days and even still now. TV crews were there, it was like radio, it was email, it was telephone. Huge, huge, huge public interest in this, and we're pleased to help. Mm -hmm. Point out though that um, we just celebrated 1,001 nights with Kepler, so having a thousand stories come out. <laughs> <laughs> Great, I'll repeat this for the John Jenkins from the Kepler team just said that Kepler has just celebrated 1,001 nights, so having 1,000 articles is very appropriate. So when the next Kepler Science Conference happens two years from now, that'll be 1,700, so you'll have to be able to get 1,700 articles. <laughs> Okay, great. So we have this huge interest. Students love it. We don't expect all students to work on exoplanets, but we're trying to get more people working on science and engineering in this nation. And that's one thing I'm going to talk about next very briefly. So we have Kepler. And the other thing Kepler is motivating for us is we want to try to do Kepler again, but on the nearest, brightest stars like the sun. And actually, one thing I'm just going to put a little plug for my own thing. I actually brought, this is a demonstration model. This is actually a space telescope. This will be a space telescope. Right now, most of this is not a functional. It's just a demonstration. You're welcome to come and take a look at it. We call this ExoplanetSat. There's a picture of it, Artist Conception, with the solar panels that it would need to have. And actually, there are other missions, too. I'll just talk about this one tonight. But the idea is now that Kepler has been such a huge success, looking at 150,000 stars very far away, can we go now and look at stars that are very close to Earth? And what ExoplanetSat would do, we have a launch date for a prototype in late 2013, we'd go up and we'd look at very bright stars all around the sky. They're all around the sky, so you can't have a single telescope. You need to send up individual telescopes to look at each star. Now, just for my colleagues in the room, initially it'll be radial velocity, known planets from radial velocity follow-up. That's what it will do. And uh, we're working hard on this. But what I like about this is we had a design and build class at MIT where students worked on it. Those were the students in the pictures. They worked on this and they were able to help build parts of it and develop key foundational parts. So Kepler has motivated a huge other number of space telescope mission concepts and that's been really great. And that's partly why we do exoplanets. People love exoplanets, students love it, we're training the next generation of people and that is really exciting for us. So if we can't go there, why look? Remote sensing of planetary interiors, atmospheres and biosignatures, STEM education and inspiring innovation, and space technology. Okay, now I'm going to summarize my talk. I answered the four questions I get asked most often. What would aliens see looking at Earth from afar? They would see the pale blue dot that varies with brightness and time. So if they saw that, they'd know that we have clouds and ocean or continents and ocean. <laughs> they would also see our atmosphere, if they could look at our atmosphere and look at spectra, and see carbon dioxide, oxygen, ozone, and water vapor. When we find another Earth, well, I gave you a very, that was most of my talk, I gave you a long explanation about if we want to do direct imaging and block out that starlight that is 10 billion times brighter than the planet, that'll take a very long time. I tried to convey how complicated it would be to get rid of the starlight. That's 10 to 25 years. If we want to do the big Earth around the small star that's transiting, that could be any time, and we could wait till the launch of the James Webb Telescope to look at the answer. <coughs> if we want to find an Earth-sized planet in a habitable zone, that will happen with Kepler sometime in the very near future. 
can we go there? We described the huge interest people have in going to the other stars. Not for now. If we can't go there, why look? I just told you about remote sensing from afar and inspiring innovation and education. And I just want to leave you with one thought because I truly believe that someday we will find a way to send probes or send ourselves to the other stars. And one thing we are really excited about on the heels of Kepler is to actually map the very nearest stars to find every kind of planet possible around the 100 nearest sun-like stars. And when we do that, we really hope that we're leaving a legacy for generations beyond. Everybody just <laughs> started coughing, so I'm not sure if that's related to how you feel about this particular idea. <laughs> but I want you to really think about this for a minute. And I want you to think back over the hundreds and thousands of years that you learned about in school, which school was a long time ago for most of us. And what do you really remember from all of that? What really stands out? Well, for most people, we'll agree that what, one of the things that stands out is Christopher Columbus and the voyage to the New World, discovering the whole New World, although that was commercially motivated. And granted, it didn't work out very well for the people in the New World. But Christopher Columbus went there, and it's something we all remember is something that really changed our world. Well, we really believe that hundreds or a thousand years from now, people who are embarking on interstellar travel will look back and will remember us. That's the Kepler team and the other people and those of us trying to do direct imaging. Remember us as the generation that first found the Earth-like worlds. Thank you. Okay. Sarah, could I kick off with the first question? Sure, go ahead. What, is there a cheaper way to do uh, the direct imaging than the terrestrial planet finder concept? Is there anything that can, is an intermediate step? Is uh, there an intermediate step? Well, if you read this carefully, remember how I told you at the beginning that all the words are chosen very carefully? It depends what you really want to do. If you want to go and map the nearest stars and find all the planets that you can find around the 100 nearest stars, and you don't have the requirement that you must find the Earth, because maybe it's not there around the 100 stars, and you say, I just want to find them and not characterize them, not take a spectrum. I went overboard about the spectra. I want to find spectra. But if you kind of reduce things that way, it may be doable easier. But we're still working on it. You know, Kep, we're still, uh, trust me that I and others are working on this. We don't have an answer for you now, but I wouldn't be here spending you know, a third of my talk on direct imaging if I didn't believe that it was going to be possible in my lifetime. But I hope to live a very long time. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, he wants the microphone. Hi. I uh, am at this age where I was uh, raised with a beautiful theory that you needed a Jupiter size um, planet that did a nice job of blocking out all the um, you know things that could hit the Earth, and um, you know you needed a, a, a solar system. So my question is, um, um, you know, if we find a, a Goldilocks uh, type planet, uh, I guess the next question is, is do we want that solar system? Do we want that exo moon? And how are you integrating that in um, in your search? Great question. And I'll just jump in before. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to know the question, the answer about the do you need a moon? January 4th, come back to our, uh, our okay. January 4th talk and uh, you'll find out the answer, but yeah. Well, I think I need to come back to that talk and argue with the person giving the talk. Because I would like to argue that life is resilient and life will find a way to live regardless. And that we are, nature is more creative than we are. I'd like to argue we don't need a moon. People think we need a moon to stabilize Earth's obliquity. There's evidence that Mars has had a spin flip. But that spin flip happens over millions of years. Uh, yeah, I'll talk. You know, I don't want just, a, people don't just want a Goldilocks People don't want just a Goldilocks planet. They want Goldilocks on the planet. <laughs> yeah, they want Goldilocks on the planet. Well, that's SETI, actually. That's the SETI Institute in finding the intelligent life. We all want to find the intelligent life. But let me say, but I'll just address Jupiter, then I'll address the question more generally. But the idea is that Jupiter is a good guy because if there's something bad that comes in, like a comet, it'll go to Jupiter first. Jupiter's more massive and will track things. And the other way to look at it is Jupiter's a bad guy because Jupiter made the asteroid belt, which was kind of useful for us because we got water delivered to Earth. But, you know, those asteroids can be bad. So I look at Jupiter's two ways. It created this very unstable body of objects that kind of come in and to our inner solar system and come towards Earth. But it could also be good. So it's not really clear whether or not you really need to have Jupiter. And Jupiter's also very hard to find. Part of the talk was, remember I said, if we want to find the easy thing, the big Earth around the small star, it's easier than the true Earth analog. Jupiter's quite hard because it's so far from the star. For most of the techniques, it ends up um, it's just you have to wait for it to go around, and it takes 12 years. So I don't think we need these things. I think, ultimately, if we can do direct imaging and find signs of water vapor or oxygen, we don't really need, we'd like to know about the other ones to fill in the details, but that it won't be essential. So in general, I mean, I don't know why those people like to argue what we have. We call it just terracentrism. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm, I'm excited for when we find the, the spectrum of an exoplanet. 
but uh, looking at, at the, the evidence we have on, on a nearby exoplanet named Mars and the, the methane that shouldn't be there and the fact that it waxes and wanes seasonally, can you speculate as to how compelling evidence of biogases and other atmospheres would actually be Great since question. we're not convinced mm -hmm. about Mars? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I'll just start out by telling one of my best interactions with Jill was we were in the Vatican and I was saying, well, we have all these biosignature gases, but the problem is we will never be 100% sure. In some cases, we might be 99% sure, and I'll get to that. In other cases, we may only be 50% sure, only 25% sure. And Jill looked over at me and she said, we'll know. They'll be sure when they find. Now, here's the thing with Mars is there's only the teensiest amount of methane produced. Some people don't even believe it's a robust signal. If you saw so much methane, though, orders and orders of magnitude more than that could be created by geophysics, it would be much more compelling as a sign of life. So that's what we're looking for. We're not just looking for something that we think could be created on geophysical scales. We're looking for something that is so much in the atmosphere that it really is hard to explain any other way. But could it be explained another way? Well, most cases the answer is kind of a yes, because geophysics and geology only has the same chemicals to work with that life does. Life has a bit of an advantage because they have thermodynamic way to catalyze the reaction with enzymes, but that's a technicality. So for some cases like ozone, we can only think of one or two ways that it can be produced that's not biological, and there are other indicators of that. So we can't be totally sure, but in some cases we will be sure, other cases will only be partially sure. So it's a good point. And the methane on Mars, it's just produced in such little quantities, we really don't know the origin. Oh, I had a question, and that was you're talking about signatures in the um, atmospheres of oxygen, ozone, so forth and so on. When you look at Earth's history, of course, oxygen is a relatively recent arrival in our atmosphere. So what about early Earth type atmosphere that obviously had life as long ago as, four, you know, three and a half, four billion years? Yes, good question. People like to think of methane. I know it doesn't sound that imaginative, but okay, methane is a gas that perhaps the world was covered with slime and methane also was prevalent in our atmosphere. So people have thought about early Earth and so thought about methane. So mm -hmm. you saw that in a well, we like oxygen so much because, and you know, trust me, I just spent three years on this. Not to say that means that I'm totally right, but oxygen is really so unique. Things like methane, it comes off of the mid-ocean ridges. Methane comes out geophysically, geologically. So the other gases that one can think of, and you can review all the gases produced by life on Earth, and there's a dozen or two of them. They're actually just either produced in very small quantities or they're a gas that is also produced just by natural processes. So that people do think about this. They come up with things like DMS. I don't know if anyone here knows what DMS is, dimethyl sulfide. It comes off of phytoplankton. But there's other things too. So yes, there is a sort of growing and growing body of things about this. So we are going to have a menu to work from. But it's problematic. So the uh Kepler uh, radio telescope folks must be very excited about <clears throat> hearing about these Kepler uh, optical observations. Can you comment about the synergy uh, between those two programs? Are you yeah. talking about SETI radio and Kepler right. optical? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So well, why don't I let Jill answer and, that? And when, when will we get an answer if there's somebody on these planets? OK, that's a great question for Jill Tarter here. <laughs> Well, um, as it happens just Monday morning, we were able to relaunch our observations of the Kepler world using the Allen Telescope Array. <laughs> so we had put the telescope into hibernation in April because our partners at Berkeley had run out of operating funds. We found another partner, um, which we hope will turn into a long-term uh, relationship, and the public has begun to help support the SETI program. So we, we started observing again. We're focusing on these 54 candidates um, in the habitable zone of which uh, Kepler 22b is one. Um, it takes about four and a half days, I'm sorry, four and a half hours to cover the entire um, microwave spectrum that we want to explore per star. It's just not efficient to do it that way. We take it in chunks and we do all the targets over one chunk of spectrum. The answer is we'll have done these, these uh, candidates very quickly and then we'll go on to the other 1,235 or now 2,326 candidate planets and that's what we're going to be spending the next two years looking at. Or sooner if it happens. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. Um, you uh, 
uh, people want to go there, right? But at the same time, there's a certain tension in the funding between manned spacecraft and science. Um, you want to comment on that? I do. I do want to comment on it. <laughs> so the problem is that resources are a problem. And it's so expensive to go to space because nobody wants to see a fellow human being being blown up. And risk you know, is a problem. In space. <laughs> they don't want to be blown up in space. OK, good point. <laughs> well, I guess you don't want to blow up your friends. Let's put it that way. So the question is, how is this going to get off the ground? How are we going to travel to the other stars? We all want to, but if we're not even going to the moon or going to Mars, how is this ever going to happen? And that's a problem. Well, we're all kind of waiting and watching to see what happens with the commercial spaceflight world. And I believe if anything's to happen, it's those people who are going to have to get it done. <coughs> the problem is they have no way, they have no market economy, if you will. They don't have something to sell that can keep themselves self-sustained. So in the short term, NASA is basically funding this commercial spaceflight world. They're funding <coughs> you know, three different companies to come up with an idea for getting crew up to the space station. The Falcon 9 is going to launch soon, and that will do commercial resupply to the International Space Station. So we'll see what will happen. But I think you have to have in th these individuals who are highly motivated. And it appears that some of the individuals in the commercial spaceflight world, they themselves really want to go to Mars. And if they really want to go, they're going to try to make it happen in some way. So I think that that's really the only way that I see now, is having individuals who have the capability and even if they have to, in the short term, use NASA funding and do basically contracts for NASA, I don't see how else it will happen based on resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it conceivable to uh, do what Kepler is doing, which is to observe 150,000 stars simultaneously and, uh, and yet do it spectrographically? Uh, I can see that that would uh, vastly improve your efficiency uh, in, uh, in looking at these planets. Wow. The question is, can you do what Kepler's doing but look spectroscopically? And you, I think, I guess technically you could figure out a way to do that. But you wouldn't be getting light from the planet. You'd be getting light from the star. You'd be looking at the star spectroscopically. Right. So it depends what you're looking for. What are you thinking of? Well, I mean, you could do, uh, you know, sub, uh, I'm sorry, you could do a uh, single, sub single subtraction, you know, to uh, try and uh, 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 determine the uh, spectra for the transiting planets. People have been following up the transiting planets individually. One of the issues with spectra is you're spreading the light out instead of Kepler, which is collecting all the light from the visible wavelengths. And so you may not have enough photons to do what you're interested in. If the stars are far away, if you want 150,000 of them, you need a patch of sky with stars that are mostly quite distant and faint. It's a good concept. I'll have to give it some thought. Could you do something, once you've used Kepler to find some uh, possible Earth-like planets, use some of the large ground-based telescopes to actually do the spectra and do the spectra subtraction to look for uh, the s small signature you might see for a planet? Good question. Either reflection mm -hmm. or absorption if it's, while it's doing the transit. Yeah, this is a question that the answer is often confusing. Because Kepler is a discovery mission, and the question is if you're going to do a follow-up spectrographic mission, can you look at the Kepler stars? And on the whole, the answer is no. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes to try to explain that. The probability for a planet to transit is very small. The system, we believe that orbital you know, inclinations of stars are all random, but some of them are going to be lined up just so, and that's random. So the distance, the probability is low. So Kepler needs to look at a lot of stars, 150,000 of them, in the hopes of finding some that are lined up properly. Now, if you need a lot of stars, 150,000 stars, they have to be faint. That's what I want to try to explain. You know when you go outside at night, you look around, you see bright stars are spread all around the sky. Well, if you were to look at any patch, let's just say there are more stars that are fainter. You know, just like you think of a crowd of people, there are more people further away from you than there are closer. And those further away stars are going to be fainter if they're sun-like stars. So the Kepler stars on the whole, to get 150,000 stars by that argument, they're quite faint. And they're usually too faint for follow-up spectroscopy. So it turns out that we probably cannot do the atmosphere observations. For the big giant planets that are hot with puffy atmospheres, yes, with the James Webb, we can fault those atmospheres. But for the Earths, they're going to be too small for us to do. So Kepler's goal is to find how frequent other Earths are, how common they are. It was never intended to provide a pool for follow-up. And that's why we want to do ExoplanetSat and TESS and other missions that will look for the Kepler analogs around nearby stars so we can follow them up. So you, had a, you sponsored a lecture series at MIT earlier this uh -huh. year, and I just wanted to thank you for putting it up online. Okay, great. And I hope you do it next year as well. The next 40 years, you mean? 
Yes, years. it was the next yeah. 40 years, right? Yeah, I had this. Um, I actually got tired of traveling to conferences because the Kepler one I made an exception for. It's been wonderful. But typically at meetings, there's just so many meetings in, in astronomy, astrophysicists. They love going to meetings. They love, I think they love it. I don't, people are on the go. The people here who come to this meeting <laughs> next week, they'll go somewhere else. And as soon as the holiday's over, they'll have the AAS meeting. These people are constantly traveling. And I just went to the meetings, and a lot of them, there just wasn't anything new. So I had a, a conference, I called it the next 40 years of exoplanets. I have to admit, it was actually my birthday. So I wanted to have a meeting, I called it the next 40 years of exoplanets, because 40, I saw as kind of the halfway point, what would happen in 40 years. And I invited all of my uh, friends, and I pushed them to be provocative and say something really meaningful. And I tried to kind of increase the quality of the conference. But we put it online because only a small number of people showed up. So if you want to see some interesting talks of what people think we will do in terms of finding Earth-like worlds in the next 40 years, you should definitely come out to there. And we had Natalie actually came out as a representative from the Kepler team, and she talked about Kepler. Yeah, and Jeff Marcy as well. Yeah, well, His talk you was to... very interesting. Okay, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, let me think. It's on my web page. I'm trying to remember. It's, I, call, I don't know if you can write it all, write it down, but seegerexoplanets.mit.edu slash next 40 years dot htm and from there you can see it's all all the videos are online okay so for my question kepler's mission is to establish the frequency of earth-sized planets so i just wanted to gauge your your guess or your colleagues guess also what probability do you think alpha centauri system has an earth-sized planet what is the probability that alpha centauri has an earth-sized planet great question now alpha centauri is complicated because it's a binary and it's, a, it's somewhat um, kind of a close, not what a, a traditional close binary, but it's somewhat close. What are the chances? And by the way, what I like about the Kepler team is everyone on the team, nobody will speculate what the frequency of Earth-sized planets and Earth-like orbits is, because you just have to wait for enough time and actually get the answer. Why extrapolate now? You could be completely wrong. So what is it? So we have no real scientific basis of, of guessing. It will just be a pure guess. And I'm going to guess that, yes, there is one. I would like to guess that. And I'd also like you to know that the inclination of that system you know what it is? If you believe that the planets, that the binary is in a plane together and that the plane of planets is also you know, perpen um, in the equatorial of the star, it's 11 degrees offset from being edge on. So in our own solar system, you know the planets are not orbiting exactly equatorially for our sun. They're offset by up to 7 degrees. So I'd like to guess maybe there's even a transiting one. Sir, mm -hmm. the, um, the exosat cubes, how many? do you plan to orbit? And what will be their on-orbit lifetime? Because it's a lot of, you know, the, the problem with cubes is that you can fly them easily, and the problem with cubes is that there are a lot of space junk. Space junk, yeah. The CubeSat community, the people who s support the CubeSat community haven't yet acknowledged the space junk issue. And one of the issues for a CubeSat launch is that the lifetime must be 25 years or shorter. That's still a long time, isn't it? If we're going to be populating, if I'm going to put up dozens, and then NASA's sending up 20 a year, but probably it's going to be more. The rest of the world's sending up a bunch. That's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things. Now, many of them are dropped off. Like the Falcon 9 is going to drop six of these off every time it goes to the International Space Station. It'll drop them off at 325 kilometers altitude. Those things will only last a couple of months. It turns out down there, um, we want to go a little higher, so our lifetime would be year on the order of years. Yeah, space junk is definitely a problem here. In the future, we may see ways that people deorbit. They may be able to deorbit having miniature micronewton thrusters. It's something I'd love to talk more about, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Last one. Last one. Oh, that's extra dumb question. All right, so earlier you hinted that there's probably uh, don't ask you about things we are looking for that we can't see, but magnetic fields, is there any thought to how we might be able to detect if an uh, exoplanet has a magnetic field of any substantial level? question is magnetic field. Does, how can we detect them at all? The only thing I've seen that looks reasonable is people looking for magnetic fields where the magnetic field of planet and star interact with each other and cause some excitement on the star itself. And there's some evidence even for this to exist, that the planet, the star, shows some magnetic activity on the same orbital period as the planet. But that is one of those things that there is really no good way to detect that I'm aware of right now. OK, well, if you have any further questions of Sarah, I uh, would encourage you to come up and speak to her after this. Um, Sarah, as a commemoration of Thank your you. talk, we have a, spe a special Are We Alone nice. uh, 
cup uh, and uh, please join me in thanking Sarah for a great trip. <laughs>